Okay. Welcome everybody. Welcome to the finance workshop and I'm just going to hand it over. All right. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, um, my name is Mick McCarty. I'm uh, chairing this uh, workshop. Uh, we have a couple of uh, invited speakers lined up. Um, I updated the schedule at the end of the day, um, later in the day yesterday. Um, and uh, so if anybody wants to check that out, I will throw the link in here. Yeah, one moment, I was looking at a different one. Okay, there you go. So we have so the the format that we're going to have today is um, we're going to go through uh, a couple of talks from invited speakers. Uh, we have folks from uh, Barclays, Chase, and Capital One. Um, and then uh, if anyone else has showed up, and they, we have like a small section for lightning talks. Uh, if anyone would like to talk about some of the work that they're doing with finance and Dask, um, they're more than welcome to. And then we'll go into kind of the Q and A discussions topic session at the end. We'll take a break too before we do that. So first up, we have uh, Two Sigma. Um, I'll let you guys go ahead and share your screen. Please introduce yourself, talk about your background, um, and looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say. Thanks for joining us. OK, great. Um, can everyone see screen OK? Yep, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Cindy and today we're kind of going to be talking a bit about how Dask is implemented at Two Sigma. Sorry, I might have to switch. Okay, so yeah, again, like I said, just some contents. Um, we want to give an overview of how we have set up and extended Dask for our internal use. And so I'm going to give an overview of Dask Cook, which is one of our internal products to use Dask. And Elaine is going to give an overview of Elastic Clusters. So for an introduction, um, my name is Cindy. I work on modeling tools at Two Sigma. And uh, our goal as a team is to provide a comprehensive, unified, and productive research platform for modelers. And one area that we focus on specifically is enabling and supporting distributed compute frameworks. Hi everyone, I'm Elaine and I'm on the learning engineering team. My team works on implementing and adapting machine learning and optimization techniques to help with the model building process at Two Sigma. Okay, so now jumping in a bit more to the Dask Cook overview. Um, so kind of the motivation for the creation of this product uh, DAS capabilities were previously kind of possible, but pretty limited at Two Sigma. And so in creating this new product, we were thinking about how we could allow researchers to seamlessly create and control clusters, gain access to specialized resources, i.e. GPU workers and things like that, and move workflows into the cloud. And so that was kind of like our uh, reason, reasoning for creating this product. Okay, so for an initial overview of what is Cook. So the Cook scheduler is an open source scheduler that we have um, at Two Sigma that um, lives between our distributed compute frameworks and our Kubernetes clusters. And it provides a kind of unified entry point for all of the different um, frameworks that we have to schedule jobs on our different clusters. And so um, it takes in a command and then matches them to uh, an available host based on like, you know, different requirements like memory, resource and other resource constraints. And so for a bit of an overview of the architecture, we created this TS Cook cluster class, which has a scheduler that's run in the same process. And then the TS Cook cluster sends requests to Cook based on um, the user scaling up and down, things like that, to start up the workers. So you can specify any number of workers you want and um, they'll scale up on Cook in Cook Managed Kubernetes pods. And so for some details about the implementation, um, this is kind of how we've extended the open source Dask um, API. So we have um, TS Cook cluster, which extends spec cluster. 
And like I said, it has the in-process scheduler. And on top of that cluster, we've added a monitoring thread, which checks in on all of the remote workers periodically. And then we've also extended process interface with Cook Worker to set up the Cook specific information that we need. So for example, the command, the resources that we need, um, the cluster we want to run on, any information like that. And then we also add additional information to track the remote Cook job status and then specify Cook specific stuff for starting, closing, restarting the worker um, and those kinds of functions. So now going more into the journey of a job. So this is kind of what happens when you call tscookcluster.scale. So what happens is that once you want more workers, you have to ask Cook to kind of set these up for you. So what you provide is the job spec. So you can specify memory, CPU, GPU requirements. Um, you can specify which cluster you want to run on, anything like that. And then Cook, you send the request to Cook and it gives you back the ID so you can later get more information about it. And then once Cook has like in the background appropriately matched it to a host um, and the job is started up, we run the Dask Worker CLI command. And so through that, we can pass any worker arguments that we have. So this is where you can specify any of the Dask Worker CLIs, like name, resource label, or if you want to do any like preloading or anything like that, this is where that would happen. And so then after the command has run and started up, you have this um, task worker, which is running independently in this pod. Okay, so another thing that we kind of mentioned before is that our TS Cook cluster has a monitoring thread, which um, kind of monitors all of the remote Cook jobs. So there's a few different steps that we have to go through to ensure that everything, the status of, of our cluster is kind of where we want it to be. So the first thing we do is clean up any jobs that are unnecessary. So if the user has scaled down or something, this will take care of killing the excess jobs and um, cleaning up any results of that. And so then with the query and restart dead jobs, we have to periodically ask Cook what the status of our jobs is. So just in case something has died due to some error or been preempted or something like that, um, we want to make sure that the status is exactly what we want and then do what we need from there. So if we need to restart the job or something like that, um, this is where we find out and take that action. And then in start new jobs is when we um, are scaling up. So we need you know, to submit new jobs to Cook and this step takes care of that. And then the start waiting jobs um, is from when we add an exponential back off to avoid consistently restarting workers that had some kind of issue. And so we add a temporary wait if um, a worker has died. And so this entire thing runs on a 15 second cycle, which just allows us to make sure that the status of our jobs is exactly where we want it to be and that um, nothing unexpected is happening. Okay, and so this is um, the resulting usage that we see. So from a modeler's perspective, um, if they have this in a notebook, they can easily just spin up a, cook a TS Cook cluster, um, create the client, scale it, um, use the scalar adapt API as they need to, and then they have access through the client to any desk APIs that they wish. So here we just have an example of map, but you can also use any collections, desk delayed, anything like that. Okay, and so one thing that we're considering for future work is that we'd like to replace the remote monitor as we have kind of created this and built more features on top of it, it's kind of gotten more complex, which makes it kind of difficult to understand and debug. So we've been exploring transitioning that into a scheduler plugin instead and kind of moving this functionality into, um, into there instead to make it a little bit cleaner. Okay, and then um, we just wanted to talk a bit more about one of the features that we added, which was mixed worker clusters. So one use case that we saw was that um, people might have different types of tasks that they wanted to assign to different types of workers. So for example, they might have tasks that they wanted to designate to GPU workers, but then it wasn't necessary for all of the workers to run on GPU workers. Um, so what we did was we added a concept of worker types where each worker type has a name and a spec. And so you might have CPU workers and GPU workers. And then we extended the spec cluster scale and adapt API in order to manage these new mixed clusters as well. Um, and so then we also created a, a mixed cluster adaptive 
in order to prioritize certain worker types for removal and add customization for users there. Okay, so now moving on to Elaine, who's going to talk about elastic clusters. Okay, great. Thank you, Cindy. Um, sorry, wait, I'm going to give you access. Let me see. Okay, I think it's working. Cool. So now I'll be taking over to talk about another Dask adaptive extension that we're working on called Elastic Clusters. First, a bit of background. Um, historically, at Two Sigma, Dask users will create clusters with a fixed number of workers, but that usually means that resources are either being under allocated or over allocated. Um, so we can take this task graph as an example, where task A is the first task um, to be run and completed, and then the arrows represent dependent tasks. So after task A runs, B will run, and then followed by that C, D, and E. So if we create a fixed size cluster with four resources at time one, um, task A will run, at time two, B will run, and three, uh, C, D, and E will run. But this ends up leaving some resources idle because at the first two time points, we really only need to open up one resource. And at the third time point, we only need three resources. So if we tried to save resources a little bit, we could have two resources available. Um, but in this case, we're under allocating relative to how we can parallelize the computation. Um, so we increase the total runtime of the DAG. And even when we're under allocating, it's still possible to leave resources idle. Instead of creating clusters with a fixed size, we can think about creating dynamic clusters that scale depending on the number of tasks that can be run in parallel um, at any given time. So this is what we call elastic clusters, where the cluster would have one resource available per task and leave no resources idle. Dask has a default adaptive interface that has this idea of dynamically allocating resources based on the scheduler's load. And Dask uses a profiler to estimate the runtime of each task. One key function in the adaptive interface is this target function that returns the number of workers that a cluster should have. Um, I simplified this function a little bit, but the default target function looks something like this, where the main computation is finding the number of workers. And the number of workers is computed by taking the expected total duration um, of all of the tasks divided by the target duration. Task Adaptive works well when tasks have known durations that the profiler can estimate very effectively. But there are tasks that Dask label as unknown, which means um, the profiler isn't able to estimate the expected duration of the task. And one example of these unknown type of tasks is our internal functions at Two Sigma. Um, in these cases, we found that Adaptive struggles to identify how many workers to allocate. Um, adaptive is also not fully elastic, meaning it's not going to allocate um, the number of workers to run all unblocked tasks in parallel. And this is because it relies on the target duration rather than the goal of trying to run tasks that can be run in parallel as much as possible. Because of these limitations, we wanted to extend adaptive. So in particular, we implemented a custom target function, which looks kind of like this. Um, also simplified a little bit, but the main idea is that the number of workers at any time is the number of unblocked tasks in the task graph. Elastic clusters can reduce the amount of idle resources, as we saw in the first example. Um, and it can also 
reduce wall time since unblocked tasks should be able to run in parallel. Another advantage is that it can reduce the configuration burden um, and it will help make that task experience easier on the user because they won't have to estimate how many workers they're trying to, they need to spin up to run certain tasks. To test the capabilities of Elastic Cluster, we conducted an experiment against fixed size clusters. Here are the cluster types that we compared. Um, adaptive here refers to Dask's default adaptive cluster. Elastic, which we just talked about, is our extension of the Dask adaptive interface. And then cluster types 4, 8, 15, and 20 refer to fixed size clusters um, of those respective sizes. And on each cluster, we submitted a task graph that looks like this. Um, we chose this narrow wide, narrow wide structure um, as kind of a stress test for elastic clusters. And um, if you want to think about like what this task graph could be doing, task A could be joining two data sets together. And then at the next level, tasks B through K um, could be computing different metrics on that join data. And then at L, doing some summarization of all of the um, computations. And then finally, at tasks M through Z, uh, maybe we're computing um, a second layer of metrics. So the first set of results here um, is the runtime per cluster, or how long did it take for all the tasks to complete on each cluster? Um, one thing you may have noticed is that the default adaptive cluster isn't included in this chart. And this is because we ran into issues running our tasks using adaptive. Um, it, wouldn't, was, it wasn't able to estimate the target number of workers and eventually timed out. So what we observe here is that Elastic isn't the fastest running cluster, but it's quite comparable to the other clusters. It also has a relatively low variance and few outliers. Um, and the other metric we recorded was the number of workers used at each time point. The y-axis here is what we call worker area, which is found by computing the area of the curve generated by the number of workers used over time. This shows how many resources are saved when using an elastic cluster compared to other clusters. Um, so even though elastic would scale up to 10 to 15 workers, because at some point in our task graph, we have 15 workers that can be run in 15 tasks, sorry, that can be run in parallel. Um, the worker area is still smaller than the fixed size clusters with 15 workers and above. So if we knew ahead of time and we had this graph, these two graphs in front of us, um, we would know that the ideal cluster size is probably either four workers or eight workers for this particular task graph that we're running. Um, but our users tend not to think about this. And the size of our cluster also varies greatly depending on what the size of our data is and what kind of task we're running. Um, so the advantage with Elastic is that you don't have to guess. And while you might not get the fastest runtime, um, you'll get pretty close to a good runtime and you won't have to suffer from guessing incorrectly and having to rescale your cluster to a better size and run the tasks all over again. So overall, we see that Elastic Clusters uses fewer resources over time um, while maintaining a pretty competitive runtime. It also makes the Dask experience a little easier on the users because they don't have to think about the size of their clusters. Some of the next steps are to test Elastic on different task graphs of varying shapes and sizes. We'd also like to extend other adaptive functions, for example, the workers to close function, making sure that workers are closed only if they're not going to be used for a while. Um, and finally, it'd be great if we could estimate the memory requirement of tasks um, and be able to dynamically update the worker memory limits. We hope you learned a little bit more about how Dask is set up and extended at T-Sigma. 
And we love to hear from you um, during like the breakout rooms and during the Q&A session, um, particularly if you find any of these extensions useful in your work. And um, if you think they might be useful, could they be added to open source? And also if you've had any experiences with adaptive interface. So thank you everyone. And I'll hand it over to the next speaker. Excellent. Thank you, Elaine and Cindy. That was great. You're right on time. Um, I think we'll we'll uh, hold questions. If anybody has questions, please write them down. We're going to do uh, like a group Q and A uh, here in a little bit. Um, so now let's let's go ahead and move forward with our, our next speaker, uh, John from uh, John Moore from Barclays. Okay. Thanks. Um, let me share. Okay, I'll be a second because apparently I haven't shared on Zoom before. I have to permit it. Mm. Okay. John, while, while John's waiting for that, you might have to actually restart the Zoom and come back in. Um, I can ask a question. We can ask questions if uh, Elaine and Cindy are up for it. Cool. Uh, one question I have, uh, and any, if anyone else has questions, go ahead and post those in the chat. Uh, one question I had was, um, are you provisioning your DAS clusters on, you know, cloud resources, cloud infrastructure, or is it local on-prem? Uh, are you running in any virtualization or is it bare metal? Like what sort of systems are you running your DAS workers on? Yeah, so one of the nice things about Cook is that it allows us to, it's a unified entry point for all of these things. So for example, we have um, cloud clusters and then on-prem clusters as well. And you can use this for both. And all you have to do is like change one parameter. Okay. Does anyone else have a question? It looks like that um, that was a cluster spec uh, class. I think it was the elastic uh, cluster object. Is that like a full implementation of the cluster spec? Um, it's kind of a subclass of the, the, the spec cluster, but really it's just an, an extension of um, adaptive and everything else is the spec cluster. OK. And then does is Cook more? Is Cook like minus the the adaptive stuff? Um, yeah. So I mean, the adaptive is, um, I guess, something that is like kind of I like somewhat separate from Cook. So you can add that onto the TS Cook cluster if you want to use it, use them together. But I think that currently by default we don't add it, but we're definitely thinking about it. I have a question. Uh, so do you use this framework for only for one-off computations like in research and experiments or also for scheduled workloads like you have pipelines and stuff like that? Um, yeah, so we definitely have different um, uh, users for this. So we see, you know, things in research, research where researchers, researchers are research. trying to do things interactively. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. feedback. I don't know if you all can hear that. Okay, um, so yeah, we have people who do like interactive workloads. So like, for example, they just spin up a notebook, are submitting computation there. But then we also have like pipelines, like larger data pipelines where people are running jobs like overnight and stuff like that and um, using them for larger tasks that way. And are these on the same cluster or is there some kind of prioritization method, something like that? Um, so when you say cluster, are you saying the Cook cluster, like the Kubernetes okay. clusters where they're running. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Cook does the all the job scheduling and prioritization for us. Um, and so it automatically does the fair resource allocation and stuff like that. Awesome, thanks.
Do we have John back? I think I see uh, you. Yes, let me try. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy Line. Okay. Can everyone see a slide and hear me? Hmm? Yes. Okay. Great. Go. Okay. Um, so this is actually um, a quick skim through the, the first part of um, a longer presentation that um, uh, a couple of colleagues gave uh, a couple of years ago in PyData. So that, and they um, were Peter Wolf and Divya Shankar and Narayan. And, uh, Mohan Chen, who's here today, and myself and Tevi and Peter are all part of the same team at Barclays uh, Quantitative Analytics Modeling Systems. Um, so uh, we provide um, a lot of support and development um, around technologies, numerical methods, that kind of thing that, that support uh, the modeling efforts in our group, which is the, the largest um, sort of modeling common quant group at Barclays and spans both our, our investment bank, our wholesale bank, and our retail bank. Um, so um, I will cover more or less the first three sections here, um, discussing uh, a sort of a business problem um, that we ended up um, using uh, DAS to support in parts, um, things like um, where that fit in um, with what we wanted to do from a design point of view, how it worked out with it within the organization and so on. Um, and, and try to connect that to themes that have been coming through uh, elsewhere uh, in the summit. And I'm very interested to hear if um, uh, people have questions about what we have done and also especially to hear about um, what people in other organizations are using DASK for, how their experiences are. So um, to dive in. Main content. Um, so, um, planning is obviously a part of uh, any large enterprise is, is sort of operating model. Uh, and for, for banks in particular, like ourselves, um, stress testing is an important um, part of that. So, it comes in as a requirement from regulators, from all of the major regulators. And essentially, it's supposed to represent an assessment of how your business would perform, especially in terms of capital adequacy under conditions of, of economic stress. Um, unsurprisingly, that uh, increased a lot in scope following the financial crisis of 2008. And, and it's a major exercise, um, tens of thousands of pages of documents, um, in, and many models are connected together um, to create sort of quantitative estimates of the, the bank's performance um, during a cycle. Um, so the, the diagram on the right is kind of indicative of a range of kind of models that might be connected in such an exercise. So, um, so we were, we were faced with these uh, increased requirements coming through from the, the Federal Reserve principally for our, our US operations. Um, and this was a challenge because while it's common in large corporations for a planning process to be something that uh, might take months to play out, for example, um, the um, Federal Reserve's requirements, the so-called CCAR requirements, um, were actually to turn around analyses significantly more quickly than this. And, and they were also looking for um, things like um, sensitivity analysis to be included in results. Um, which in principle should mean that you're, you're running your entire forecasts, which is effectively what these are, or simulations, um, many times. Um, and so um, uh, the traditional way of doing things would involve a lot of um, passing around with spreadsheets in many cases between people, or if you were more sophisticated, um, you would have some kind of workflow system, or, um, but essentially there'd be an intermixing of um, manual review and adjustment with the calculation, the core calculations, with the manual review taking 
most of this. So we wanted to go beyond that and then take a sort of a completely automated approach. Um, also, um, uh, obviously this is Excel, which everyone recognizes. Excel and similar environments um, offer you a lot of capability as a single user in, in terms of they let you have the data in one place, they let you have calculations in that same place, they let you have reporting in that same place. Um, I could also say things like SAS, if anyone is familiar with SAS, offer the same. This is great on an individual level. It tends to not be so great when you, you've got people working across, te across teams. So, so we would have dozens of people working on the, model, on the modeling here. And really we want them um, to be able to work together as a larger group rather than sort of maximize individual philosophy. Um, and and yeah, uh, integration is mentioned here. So integration is often the, the sticking point in bringing together um, a set of models or other software. Um, so the approach that we took was really to try and make it um, as easy as possible for uh, individual model developers um, to code on their own uh, and for a lot of the gluing together and integration of models to be to be automated. So I'll also cover a bit um, on how, how we did that and how it relates to task. Okay, so um, the first point really here is the key. So we want, we want to establish shared conventions for working together. So um, basically we can think of a model as a, um, a function, a computer function, um, or a set of functions. Um, and we want to have users sort of write functions describing their models and then um, connect those together. And the way we're doing that is by labeling the inputs and outputs, basically by name. So we would have typically a uh, yeah, name of a variable and we'll cover that um, shortly. And in fact, I will move on because the rest will be clear by example. Um, okay, so, so in this case, uh, and this starts looking very much like a, a task graph, um, we have rectangles representing data, uh, and we have uh, circles representing uh, computation, so functions or function evaluations. And so conceptually here, um, one modeler might have written function f, one might have written modeler g, but as long as they agree that um, the data to be passed from one to the other is, is called volume, um, then the two will be capable of being joined together, is, is the idea. Um, um, so uh, I'm not going to do uh, a reprise of task given the, the, the audience, um, but the, the mapping to the task graph here is sort of you know, immediate. In fact, we, we had graphs that look basically identical to the task visualizations um, before we came to actually decide to use task. Um, we're not big users yet of the task collections. Um, but, but I will mention actually one thing on the previous slide that was important. We very much wanted to be able to use the same software um, in our desktop environments as would be running production. That we saw as completely key to having the kind of productivity that we wanted. Um, so, um, so, so Dask um, has obviously the, the task graph API. Um, that, is, that is good, but it's not what we wanted um, our end, end users or our model developers to be working with, partly because it introduces its own coordination problem, um, partly because a lot of them are, are, especially coming from some sectors, are not really experienced programmers by tricks. They, they don't think um, with, with a sort of computer science background. Um, so um, this led us to saying that what we wanted to provide was the means of joining together the, mo the models by uh, use of um, a kind of decorator markup. Um, so um, here uh, is an example of that where we have the, the function f from the, the previous um, slides. And we're just saying that um, we're creating a binding between the function arguments, which are internal to the function, and 
the variable names, which are externally visible and global. And we'll generate a DAS graph from that. Uh, in real life, it's a little bit, it's, it's one level up in complexity because we, we generate a, an element of a, of a task graph for each time period. So we're, we're simulating performance over time. So we more or less um, have one uh, calculation per variable per time period in most cases. Um, okay, and um, the essential story of, of where DAS comes in here is that when we, you know, we have um, a software library then that, that reads the decorators essentially or loads, loads the, the decorated functions uh, and is capable of generating a uh, task graph from that. that in, in our case, for, um, we'll do um, a simulation of the business performance over time. Um, and so the kind of coding you get is more like what is on the right here, um, where the modeler is mostly working in the sort of the top part uh, of the right-hand side and defining your functions. And the sort of the bottom section of the, of the um, diagram, which really talks about sequencing and joining things together um, is, is done at a library level and people don't have to individually worry about that. Um, um, we also have, and this is a bit, a bit like what Stan Siebert mentioned if you were in his talk yesterday, we have some quite, a, quite a decent use of metadata at this point. Um, we have you know, um, Python types, we have units, um, the typing extends to data frames, um, we, we haven't yet, but we are considering moving to, to arrow to defining type uh, types. Um, and so then once you have this kind of framework set up, what this lets you do is go from um, the, the level at the left-hand side of sort of an individual function written by one um, uh, modeler to their whole model, which might re represent one part of the business, um, which is a little graph of its own, to a so-called ensemble of models where we're, now we're bringing together the work of, um, you know, potentially dozens of people. Um, okay, and, and this works out well in practice. Um, I think especially it, it solves what would otherwise be at risk of being a, a complicated process of, of connecting different models together. Um, the, the clean separation between code and data or model and data is um, very beneficial to testing, debugging and so on. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a bit about, for a minute about the task graph. Um, so that, again, to a point Stan Siebert mentioned yesterday, it's really, really helpful to have an underlying um, uh, abstraction um, that was very flexible and enables a lot of things to be done with that. So, so we do execution, of course, um, but there are lots of things you can do from, from visualization to um, uh, all kinds of analyses, including performance analyses and so on. Um, so we've just sort of grown more and more into that. So I, I think, you know, initially we had some parts of our code that didn't fully reflect that. And, and what we found was when we took as much of our functionality as we could to write in a sort of uh, generic graph way, um, that tended to make it both cleaner and more flexible than uh, if we had started with something, something less general. So that was very powerful. Um, and um, yeah, so this, so this has ended up with or becoming a significant part of an overall integrated framework that includes broader work, like workflows that do involve people and has been very successful. Um, we now use it um, globally and beyond planning and stress testing for other parts of our financial work, like, like um, credit loss. Um, Dask uh, and Python generally throughout have been very much the right decision uh, from our point of view. I think like Travis mentioned on his keynote, um, um, Spark was very much what um, uh, a lot of large corporations were looking towards a few years ago, as soon as you talked about uh, any mention of scale. And so I think it's been 
like a very productive and happy outcome for us that we've been able to use Python uh, in that way. And we are seeing internally oh, no. um, broader adoption of task. So, which is and so, so that's um, where I wanted to wrap up. I'm happy to take any questions or to move into discussions. Great, thank you, John. And we also have Nathan Chin from Barclays as well here as well. So thank you as well. Um, does anybody have questions they want to ask? We, ha we have some time before we take a short break. I have one comment. Oh, I realize my video is off here. I have one one comment. Um, we've we've uh, found it very beneficial as well to separate out the the, the data logic from the analysis, um, and that's been integral for not only you know developing the same code and running it in production, but also just running it at different scales uh, because we will be able to, we'll have like the same routine that we can operate on multiple data sets at that point. Um, can can you or or some of the other folks, uh, anyone ha have any comments on um, uh, d d the in memory data structures and, and which which you may have had more success or prefer over others? Um, talking about the differences between the data frame and array interface. Um, yeah, so. We won't have a lot of direct comment on this because um, we are sort of working below the, the DAS data frame. Um, so far, um, it's been possible for us to, um, and, and we are, yeah, so far it's been possible for us to work with um, basically pandas. And, and, um, and so where, where we've looked for performance, we've sort of first done it there. Um, through um, things like using Numba. Um, um, and that's where we find um, a lot of the sort of performance benefits on sort of like a, a, multi, a large multi-core machine. So we, we haven't done a lot of real performance optimization running, running distributed. Um, and we've been able to do that, but um, we're really looking, it's starting to do that more seriously now, running multiple con, uh, connection, uh, so, so running multiple versions of these analyses. So we're, um, we have things like we want to run, you know, the entire um, graph uh, many times. Um, what we're looking or considering doing is moving from um, a more separate workflow created by technology for doing this to thinking, can um, Dask give us a more rapid path to getting that kind of scaling for basically an embarrassingly parallel problem or, or mostly embarrassingly parallel. Um, so, so we're really looking at Dask there as a kind of a productivity boost. Um, but for, for the individual runs here, so far they just about fit in with uh, a, a, a single PC's memory for what we're dealing with. We, we do manage the memory um, and uh, we, we, we tweak the schedules so that um, the, um, we don't accumulate lots of keys basically uh, in, in memory over time. Any other questions? So it's uh, almost 10 45 or 40, 45 after the hour, uh, depending on what time's in here. And 
let's um, let's take a, a quick 10 minute break and then we'll come back uh, and we'll have Kappa one speak and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll I've got some uh, discussion topics uh, we can do breakouts um, and I'll share a Google Doc with them and others can I'll, I'll do that right now uh, and if others want to add topics uh, to that Google Doc please feel free to and we'll figure out what we're going to do after the talks okay so let's take a break thanks Uh, we'll be back at uh, 55 after the hour.
All right, I've got uh, 55 after the hour. Let's go ahead and uh, get started with the next half. Uh, who are we gonna go first, Andrew? All right, so we have Andrew Mishar from Capital One. Take it away, Andrew. Thanks, Mike. I will share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes. Great, thanks. Okay, so I am Andrew Mashar. I'm a software engineer at Capital One in the Center for Machine Learning. I've been with Capital One for a little over two years. I started working on the Rubicon project, which Ryan will tell you about in just a minute. And now I'm working on an internal library to scale machine learning model development. And I want to tell you a little bit about that and talk about how we've designed that library that can hopefully inform some of your designs. Um, if you're interested in hearing more information about this topic, uh, at noon, right after this, we're going to be giving a tutorial on scaling machine learning code with DAST. Uh, if you want to hear more about other projects using DAST at Capital One, uh, Dan Kerrigan will be giving a talk about that topic uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m. But for now, I want to talk about uh, this topic, which is uh, how to write uh, custom universal custom estimators. Uh, and how, how writing them in the correct, in, in this way can help you scale and share your code across uh, your, your enterprise. Um, so to get started, our project, um, we sit in kind of a unique position where uh, we are more on the software engineering side um, and model developers are, are developing their models, training um, and, and all of that. And we're kind of trying to develop a library that sits at the core of that so people can reuse that for model development and build on top of it. Uh, and so the way that we're doing that, um, I'm going to talk through this example here from the scikit-learn documentation um, and kind of see how we would expand it and how we can avoid some of the traps you might fall into um, in trying to expand this code. So we'll start with uh, the digits data set. We'll load that up. Um, we're going to take two steps for this, this process. Um, we're going to do a principal component analysis, PCA, and a logistic regression. We'll build a pipeline with those two steps. And then we'll run that pipeline with a grid search um, in order to find our, our best estimator um, and our best model for this. OK. So this is a pretty small example, something um, you're unlikely to see in the real world. Uh, so what usually happens is you have these ideas of these are the model steps I want to take. Um, but the first thing that usually comes up is some kind of change to your data. Um, and so what might happen is a model developer uh, might look at this, this or have this pipeline in their head um, and then think, OK, I need to uh, mutate the data, whether that's filtering or dropping some some information or something like that. Um, not too important what that is for now, but just we need that extra step. Um, it's a pretty common use case that'll pop up. And what might happen as a model developer or a data scientist, um, they'll take these steps and write them kind of in a procedural manner. So, okay, I have my, my PCA, I have my logistic regression, let's split up our data, let's transform the data, mutate it, and then fit the model, right? Um, now, I think, uh, this, it, it might be pretty obvious that this is not a great way to scale uh, a model development pipeline. Um, breaking it up in this way can cause all sorts of problems, um, trying to track where you're doing things. Um, it's all in one big piece. So if you expand any of these pieces, you're just going to end up with one big file. So let's talk about some software engineering principles to get this in a better state. So we have another option here, which is, um, so, so applying some of these software engineering principles, um, trying to break up uh, the different pieces. So loading the data, mutating the data, building the model. Um, we have some initialization. So this follows some, some good software design principles in um, encapsulating our different um, steps of the model. So the um, PCA and logistic regression in that first cell, um, the grid search in the second cell, um, we're encapsulating and isolating the different pieces for loading data, for example, mutating the data. So this is moving in the right direction, but I, I want to highlight that this can be a bit of a trap in building out all of these classes 
um, and writing a kind of driver method to put them together. And the trap here is that if you try to scale this out or apply a new paradigm to this, so for example, if you're taking this code and moving from Pandas and uh, Scikit-learn to Dask and DaskML, um, it's likely you're going to build out more classes, and then you need this boilerplate over again. Um, and then more importantly, if you have a bug in one of these, you've copied a little bit of code, um, and so you'll have to cop or fix it in all of these places. Um, so how can we fix that? And this is the core of our library. Um, and a lot of what you'll see in, in the uh, documentation for DaskML is stick to the scikit-learn API. Uh, and so instead of creating these classes that encompass these larger blocks, um, create just the transformer that you need and slot that in between your pipeline steps. So here what we see is instead of um, adding a mutate step or a mutate function to a class with these other things, create the mutate transformer on its own. Um, and you can slot that into the pipeline. And that way, you don't have to worry about the PCA step or the logistic regression step. You can keep these separate. Now, this is a small example, but why this is important is, um, again, two, two main benefits we get out of this. One, uh, we're able to work across teams. So uh, a good example of this is the library that we've created is focused more on uh, uh, data pro or machine learning modeling. Um, there are other libraries at Capital One, for example, there's a good one for data cleaning. Um, we're able to interface with that seamlessly without having to work with that team directly because we both adhere to the scikit-learn API. Um, so that's one important benefit. The other important benefit is when you want to scale with something like Dask or Rapids or some other uh, paradigm for scaling or distributing your computation or data, um, you're able to do so with much less code, much less boilerplate, boilerplate code. Um, and so let's look at how that works. So another example, um, here we're creating a cross validator um, using the scikit-learn API again, we're, um, as you can see, inheriting from the base estimator from scikit-learn. Um, and what we're doing here is trying to create a pretty contained example of um, the of this cross validator. So we pass in an estimator. We can use different estimators from X2Boost or scikit-learn, um, a cross validator. So we'll, we'll uh, take the cross validator and then we'll add a small logger um, just to add some, some logging info for this example. And then um, using scikit-learn and pandas, um, we will pass the data in, we'll use a repeated k-fold as our cross validator, and we'll um, train our model using this custom CV search CV. Now, in order to scale this with Dask, all we need to do is create the client, add a little bit of code to our custom search CV, and then primarily, I'm gonna jump ahead and then come back, and then primarily for us, or for in, in, the, in the case of us at Capital One in the library we're developing, usually our users, um, the only changes they need to make is they need to read their data in um, to using Dask, so make it a Dask data frame or a Dask array, um, and then use a, a Dask XGBoost classifier rather than the traditional XGBoost classifier. Um, and so again, much less code for the implementation, now to take a step back to the um, how we put this in the class, this is kind of the core and a lot of the, the code that we end up writing for our library is making sure that the data is prepared in the right way um, before we, we, uh, we, run the, we uh, train the models. Um, and so this, this is kind of the juxtaposition against the developing a full class and trying to handle all of that. Instead of doing all this work, we abstract that to just uh, manipulating the data ahead of time and making sure that these things work. And again, because uh, DaskML uses the, uh, the scikit-learn API, we're able to do this with, with much less code. And we're able to, um, in most cases, it just works after we hand it the right data type. Uh, yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to cover. Um, so thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. And uh, I'll take any questions and stop sharing. Great. Thank you, Andrew.
Do you have any other questions? Okay. Um, next up is Ryan Soley from Capital One as well. Uh, one quick note of uh, logistics that I forgot to mention. We have a uh, workshop Slack channel. Um, I've also dropped a link for the discussion topics in the Zoom chat and in the Slack chat. Um, yeah, please join that, that workshop uh, Slack channel and I'll, I'll post a, uh, the name of that channel as, as Ryan's speaking here in the Zoom chat as well so folks can get in there. Cool, thank you, Mike. Uh, well, like Mike just said, I'm also uh, with Capital One. Let me take a step back. My name is Ryan, and I'm also with Capital One. I work in the Center for Machine Learning with Andrew on the tools team. And uh, today I'm going to show you Rubicon, a blogging tool, which was one of the very first tools that we ever built on our little team. Oh, where is Chrome? There it is. All right. So Rubicon, uh, you know, big picture is a very lightweight logging framework. We developed it specifically for, uh, for logging model runs, uh, large groups of model runs. And really we developed it for our model risk officers to uh, ensure audibility. We wanted to provide logs to them in a, uh, you know, in a standardized way so that they're not constantly having to deal with looking for new formats of logs to try and pull out the same information. So we've worked closely with them to develop, you know, some sorts of standards while at the same time uh, trying to stay very flexible as a logging library. So some of the main components here, uh, there are three big pieces. We have the Python library itself, which is built on top of FS spec. Currently that supports uh, local logging, in-memory logging for experimentation and remote S3 logging. But theoretically it should be easy to extend it to any backend that FS spec supports. Uh, beyond that, there is a dashboard for exploring your data. So we use FX spec to just write JSON files of your metadata about your experiments and your runs. Uh, so, you know, you can just look through those however you want to, but we have our dashboard solution to make that even easier. And then we also have a sharing, um, <clears throat> a sharing and collaboration piece intake to share around logs, experiments, and projects. So uh, quickly want to point out that this tool is in fact open source. Rubicon was really open sourced a couple months ago, uh, which has been super cool. It's been really great to get it out there and get some more eyes on it. And we're really excited for everyone here to see it and you know, let us, let us have it with the feedback. So before I dive into any examples, I just wanna quickly go over our terms. So like I said, the verbiage we use is based around model development. We have our projects, which would generally be like one model, one problem you're trying to solve. We have your experiments, which are particular runs of that. And you know, these experiments, you can group them based on tags or commit hashes via Git integration. So there's all sorts of different ways to organize them under your projects. And then each of these experiments can log various things, like inputs and outputs that may be relevant to that particular run. So parameters, features, metrics. And then we also have more, uh, you know, more binary file types like data frames and artifacts. So, you know, data frames work with pandas data frames and of course DAS data frames as well. And our artifacts are just the catch all for anything else you might want to log like pickle files if you need to actually store your model file. So I'll take us through Rubicon's quick look here to give us, you know, a little overview of what Rubicon's capable of. This is just basically integrating Rubicon into a simple scikit-learn example from their documentation. So here we're gonna train a simple classifier. We've just got our data loading in here. Like I mentioned, we have three main persistent types. There's in-memory for exploration and testing out. Uh, there's S3 for remote storage and there's local for local storage, of course. Uh, and again, it's all based on FS spec. So as long as you know, the FS spec backend that you're interested in using supports all of the, uh, all of the operations we use, it should be easily pluggable. So to actually get started with Rubicon, you're gonna to wanna to create your Rubicon object and simply create your first project or experiment, or project, sorry. All you're doing here is just determining what file system you wanna use and what root directory. You know, if you wanna use S3, you're just prepending the root directory with your S3 path. As long as your credentials are set up, that'll be good to go. 
And then in here is our basic run experiment function. So this is where we're actually just running, building a little pipeline and running across it. But along the way, we are logging some parameters and metrics. We're logging a confusion matrix as a data frame. And we're adding some tags at the end based on our metrics. So we can you know, then filter these experiments more easily at the end if we run this a lot. But for this particular example, we would just run it a few times and then you know, be able to look through it and see what our results are. And uh, I'll, I'm gonna go through an actual example in a second to really show a little bit more of that. A few quick callouts here, instantiating it or, or logging through different file systems is as simple as changing the instantiation here. Uh, we have a dashboard that I will show you in just a second once we hop over to the examples. But this is again, just to give you a better view into your data other than having to look through JSON files. And the last part I want to call out is our publishing and sharing piece, which is built on Intake. So if you're familiar with Intake, uh, it's a library that is made, you know, it's designed to make data access easy. And, you know, that's how we're trying to use it here. Our Rubicon object is capable of publishing Intake catalogs that reference Rubicon data, that reference either experiments or projects based on what you want to share. So for here, this particular one, we are creating a... Um, we're creating, an, we're, we're creating a catalog of experiments that were tagged with success so that we can then share that. And uh, you know, this one right here, our path is local. Normally that wouldn't really make sense. You'd wanna share an S3 thing. And the reason for that is because when you're using intake, this isn't actually like copying any data until you tell it to. So sharing this little source catalog is much easier than trying to share or version big, you know, big giant collections of Rubicon data. So that's really just an, a simpler way to you know, show your collaborators what you've experimented with so they can then pull it in and take a look. And then reading those catalogs is as simple as using intake. We just open our catalog and we can discover and read it. And now we have our Rubicon object that we can do anything with that we could with the object as if we made it ourselves. So that's the big picture. We've got our logging pieces, our dashboard and our sharing. And I just want to quickly show a few integrations with existing tools that will also, you know, highlight some more of Rubicon in action. So first, I quickly want to call out our Git integration. Uh, like I mentioned, one of the main points of Rubicon is for uh, to enforce auditability, auditability and traceability. So logging, um, logging the relevant Git information with these experiments has been super valuable to our users. They can just reference straight back to the exact code that made these experiments. So all we need to do to use this is uh, pass through, through this auto git flag and turn it on. And all that's doing is telling Rubicon that we're running Rubicon from within a directory that has a git repository initialized and it has access to any git commands it may wanna use. So what it does then is when it's creating projects and creating experiments, it's automatically locking the relevant git information it can find. So this project we just created has been given the URL to the repo that I'm, that I'm committing this, these examples to. And it's also got the branch name and the commit hash. So when we actually run the UI, uh, now here, I'm actually gonna show a different experiment that was logged, a different project, excuse me. So this project we can assume uh, is something that was shared with me. So let's say I just uh, got this from a colleague, I loaded it up and now I wanna see, um, you know, I've got, I can take a look at the data they've logged. I can explore their different inputs and outputs. Uh, I can select all of these and compare them. So I get this nice comparison plot here where it's showing how my parameters affect my metric. Uh, I can select subsets of this accuracy that I'm interested in to see what caused it. You know, looking at this one, it seems as long as my N estimators wasn't two, things are looking good. Uh, and, you know, obviously as you have more and more parameters, this gets a little more, you know, it can, you can draw more insights from it. This whole chart's very customizable. You can move things around as you need. If we had multiple metrics, we could choose a different one to compare them based off of. But big picture here with the Git integration is that each of these experiment groups are grouped by their commits. And these commits provide a direct link straight to the GitHub code that created it. So this is now just another repo of mine uh, experimenting with Rubicon where I've got some model code in here. And now I can hop right in and see exactly what model code it was that, uh, that logged that experiment. And with these other two ones here, I can hop into that same repo at different points in its history just to see what it looked like at that point. So that is the Git integration. Uh, now I wanna move on to showing how uh, Rubicon plays nicely with some other tools that Dask already plays nicely with. So you can you know, integrate all your pieces together and have a nice little, uh, you know, nice seamless thing going on. So in order to get Rubicon integrated into scikit-learn, we created the Rubicon pipeline object. 
And all this is is a wrapper around the existing scikit-learn that basically logs the inputs and outputs of your estimators between each step. So all we're doing here differently from a normal scikit-learn pipeline is just changing our input and passing along our Rubicon project. These definitions here are exactly the same as you'd expect them to be to a normal pipeline. Uh, once we get started, you know, all the normal all the normal methods are available. You would do everything like you're used to. But now at the end, we have a nice Rubicon project that we can get back that has all of our different inputs and outputs. So you can see all of our input parameters to our scaler, to our classifier, and we can see our score metric here at the end. So, you know, this is digging through this data isn't, you know, it's not much better than digging through the pipeline's metadata. But once we get into a more realistic example where we're logging, you know, where we're doing a grid search here, logging tons of things, then we can really see the value of the dashboard versus the CV results. So here, uh, this again is just an example that is uh, adapted from a scikit-learn example. Really all we changed here was replacing the pipeline with the Rubicon pipeline. Uh, so, you know, it's a super easy integration to existing code, which is something that we really, you know, want to focus on throughout the whole project. But one more call out here before we get started is I want to take a look at these user-defined loggers. So if you notice here on this one, uh, we logged every single parameter to all of our things. We might not care about all of those, and it can obviously get very verbose very fast. You can imagine that dashboard will get very cluttered with all of these different things, and they're not particularly useful, especially when we're not changing them. So what we're doing here with these filter estimator loggers are basically just selecting and ignoring the parameters we do and don't care about. So for this particular one, we're only gonna select these three. We're gonna ignore everything from this uh, transformer because we're not varying anything. And then of course here, we can just pass along some keyword arcs to our experiments. So we're just giving them a name and the model name for each experiment created during each step in our grid search. So now we can use uh, the desk backend to do our grid search in parallel. That's another call out. Rubicon logging is totally thread and process safe. As long as you're writing to the same, you know, mounted storage system or, or remote storage system, Everything should be good there. There should be no collisions or anything like that. And once everything's done, you should be able to pull the data back as if it was, you know, as if it was all one. So we log, we go through this, log our grid search. Of course, we can pull back the grid search's best score. We can take a look at the CV results, but that can be a lot to look at. It can be a lot to digest. So that's why we want to use the Rubicon dashboard for something like this. And I don't know why we're hanging here. <laughs> Come on. That's the beauty of live demos. Let me restart. This shouldn't, oh wait, there it goes. What is going on? I think I already have it running. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so now we have our grid search project. And as we can see, we got a different group of experiments for each of our uh, different things in the grid search. Uh, this particular one, you know, we can take a look in here and we'll see our, you know, the classifiers max depth and whatnot. The ones we selected are here, our accuracy is here. And now we can compare just these ones instead of having to filter through all of those different, uh, all of those different parameter sets. <clears throat> so one final integration that I wanna take a look at is another tool that you may be familiar with. Prefect is a workflow management engine and, um, you know, it can be used, it can be used for all sorts of things. But uh, prefect tasks are essentially just annotated functions. And uh, we wanted to be able to provide our users with, you know, out of the box prefect integration. So we created these Rubicon tasks. And really they're not doing anything super complex. They're just as simple as this. They're just task annotations on our existing Rubicon functionality. So they're super lightweight. It's super easy to make your own if these tasks don't do exactly what you want to do. But uh, yeah, just let's quickly look at how we would integrate them. So here we're just defining a quick little ETL pipeline. We're loading some data, transforming it a bit, and then finally fitting the same little pipeline we did from the scikit-learn example. So our normal flow would look something like this, where we just load our data and split it and do our prediction. And then once we're finished with that, you know, we then we have our nice prefect dashboard that shows us a lot of really good information about how that run executed, but there's still a lot of metadata that we care about that we can't quite pull out of there. And if you want to pull actual data like from the steps of your task, it can be very convoluted to really dig into all these, all this info and these runs and these slugs. It can very, get, get very ugly just to pull out the one result here. So that is why we want to show off integrating Rubicon into these flows. 
So essentially here, we're just adding a few extra, a uh, few extra statements. We're creating a project and experiment before our training. We're logging our inputs, running it, and then finally logging our outputs. So now this time, once we run through this, uh, <clears throat> and again, we can use the desk backend to do this concurrently to run a bunch of experiments. And instead of having to dig through all of our outputs once that's done, we can hop over to the dashboard and check out our prefect examples. And again, we've got a bunch of very nicely formatted examples that we can clearly, or logs, we can clearly look through here and see, you know, how the different runs, you know, the eight different runs of our flow affected our accuracy metric. So yeah, that's the big picture. Overall, we are always looking for new ways to integrate Rubicon. Uh, you know, we want to make it easy to use Rubicon with as many tools as possible. That's why we built it on top of tools that, you know, the PyData users should be familiar mm -hmm. with. We want to integrate it and do as many different uh, things as possible. So, you yeah, know, find a good use case for Rubicon, definitely uh, shout it out, give us a PR and let us know. So, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Any questions on Rubicon? Ryan, I may have missed you saying something about this, but um, for reproducibility, do you have a, a system for linking back to particular data sets and, and as well as model code? And yeah, so normally in that realm is where you would use the uh, intake, the intake uh, sharing, which I didn't focus on a lot here. So yeah, that's definitely a great question. That sharing capability is something that uh, is, is definitely something we would like to make more mature. So it's, it's there, there's the ability to share, to reference data via intake catalogs so that you can share your data without actually passing around large data sets. And also there's the Git integration to tie that back to code. But yeah, those pieces are definitely ones that we want to, uh, that we want to hear more about with people using them. Because as model developers, you know, we don't, I personally don't mess around with that side of things too much. So definitely, you know, that, that view is something that we're looking more of. Uh, we have a question in the chat from from Joe. Uh, did you evaluate MLflow, and if so, does Rubicon? How does Rubicon compare to it? Yeah, so we did take a look at MLflow. Uh, there are absolutely a lot of similarities. One of the big callouts in terms of uh, what's different is that Rubicon is fully open source and not tied to any platforms. So you know, your Rubi you can you know you can commit to all the parts of Rubicon. Every part of it is open source, uh, and then just in general, Rubicon is a lot more lightweight. In my experience, MLflow was a bit more prescriptive in how they wanted you to do things. Uh, that may have changed by now. It's been it's been a bit since I evaluated it. But yeah, big picture is this: we designed Rubicon to be much more open and much more lightweight in comparison. Another thing that I'll note is that um, development of Rubicon predates the existence of MLflow uh, internally to Capital One, so we were already developing it. Um, a couple of years before it came on the scene. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, I'm really, really excited to, to have Ryan talk about Rubicon here. Uh, you know, being a, it was developed within Capital One, Capital One being a financial institution, built on the PyData stack, this being a, you know, a, a desk workshop in, for finance. Um, would love to, to, to see if anyone um, has any feedback or uh, any, any new features, any new directions they'd like to see Rubicon go. We would love, love to hear uh, that feedback. So we really want to make it um, a community project. Uh, we're very excited to open source it. So now we have to build the community. So that's why we're here talking about it. So thanks, Ryan. Okay. Um, I So we have the, um, the Slack channel. Uh, I put it in the Zoom chat here. If folks want to get into that, we have uh, the um, discussion topics that we've, uh, I put some down and some folks have started to add to that. If anybody needs uh, me to repost that link anywhere, let me know, happy to do that. Um, how do we want to do this though? Uh, do we still have our chair, our session chair with us? Hey Mike, I'm here. Yeah. Hi, is there, 
is it possible? I see we have breakout rooms. Is it possible to do that? Is there a way to like, or do we want to just have like a big group discussion? We have 30 people here. It's not too bad. I don't know. How do you want to do this? Either is fine. Uh, I know the previous session we had a group discussion, no breakout rooms. So whatever folks you prefer, we can do. I think maybe if there's no objections, just do like a big group discussion. What do folks think? Any objections to that? All right, awesome. If you're comfortable going on video, that's that's nice too. And I wish we could all just like sit around a room, but these days this is this is how we do it. Uh, but it's always nice to see faces as we're talking. Um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so one discussion topic, uh, feel free if you wanna add to the discussion topic list uh, as, as we're talking here, as folks think of things. Um, but before we get into the discussions, are there any questions that anyone has uh, from any of the talks that we had uh, that they didn't get to ask? I just wanna give you an opportunity to do that. Everything's fair game. Okay, great. So we'll dive into the discussion topics. So the first one we have, which was one that, that, that we, we put up in the, in the proposal was how to, how to participate in the community when you work at a financial institution. I see someone plus one that, so thanks. Um, I wanted to make sure that we talked about that because uh, that was something that uh, the group at Capital One has uh, put a lot of effort into internally and in working with our, um, our internal uh, open source program office um, in you know, figuring out um, a, a contribution model that was scalable uh, for many different projects. Because in the PyD ecosystem, uh, one of the things that wasn't really captured in that process initially was the fact that there are so many different projects uh, and, and, and the, the open source policy was centered around individual repos GitHub repos, uh, and like DAS, for example, has in, inside of the DAS org, there are many different repo, uh, projects and repos um, in, in many other PyData uh, libraries, there, there are many different repos. And so that just kind of didn't scale. So that was one of the first things that we had to figure out with our, our open source program office was how to, how to build out a, a contribution model um, that would scale because the way it was, it, you had to like submit like five number five PRs or something like that uh, to be reviewed per project in order to be a, a trusted contributor on that project. And so you, as you can see, if you had like 20 projects you had to contribute to, it just was this massive barrier to entry. And a lot of the folks just didn't get off the ground because they didn't even understand what if they could if, if that meant that whether or not they could open an issue or not. So we actually found a lot of users inside uh, of our institution that were struggling to use and not just ask, just other, other libraries within the PyData stack and uh, didn't really understand how to communicate with the community in order to get those, raise awareness for those issues, but also um, get, uh, you know, just, just get the get feedback from the community and whether or not they're, they're using uh, the, the libraries correctly or how to improve their code or whatever. There was just like no communication there. Um, and so they never got off the ground. So I'm curious to hear other folks uh, in on the call here as to whether or not what your experience was like um, and feel free folks from capital one to add add to anything that I missed but that's that's essentially what I want to talk about here is just kind of uh, open source literacy first but then also like figuring out how to um, be able to responsibly con contribute to these projects that are responsible for the projects but also responsible for the financial institution making sure that we're not leaking any intellectual property or things like that so uh, any anyone else just to add on to what you said, since uh, that process that you described that no one wanted to participate in because it was um, just kind of opaque and unclear as to how you were supposed to proceed through each step, we've since deployed an internal tool that automates on a git commit level, as in like a git commit hook, um, the review process that where things just have to go through IP review, legal review, uh, et cetera. So, I think that's really made a huge difference in how many people are contributing to open source within Capital One.
I have a question. How many people from financial institutions uh, feel that they can contribute on behalf of their company and not on their personal laptops, which is, I think, how it mostly goes? So, so Barclays is supportive, and, um, but you know the, the process side of things, like similar to what you mentioned, have been ones that there have been frictions there, and, and we're still working to improve that. So, I'd actually be really interested to know, like when you um, talked about the the Git um, process for initiating reviews and so on, um, do you essentially work with it's sort of from GitHub, it's called, or do you work with, you know, like an, an internal um, fork of, effectively? So I'm wondering how, how, how do you manage things like um, continuous integration testing? Do you rely on what the project has on GitHub or do you set that sort of thing up internally as well? In the past, we've set it up internally, but um, now it works you essentially you register your personal account and you work there with within your fork and um, you register the internal tool uh, with your on that repo uh, as a git commit hook so it we're essentially relying on that external uh, ci in the normal git process Yeah, but prior prior to that GitHub being GitHub hook or that GitHub being developed, uh, it was very it was a very human driven process. Like there, like you would submit a form in another web page with your PR, um, but it would be like an internal because uh, we'd fork we'd fork the uh, the public project, submit the PR internally so we could do that kind of internal legal review and, and PI review IP review, and. Um, submit that in this form and we had to wait for individual humans to like go through and review and it was just that became a you know a, a huge bottleneck right because if you're submitting multiple prs to different projects you're just waiting for this yeah so streamlining that aspect of things is, is one that you know we are working towards as well i mean it sounds like the target state would be similar. I think I think the organization now has a reasonably good understanding of open source and the benefits of having a it's called a progressive and open attitude towards it. But we still have to work through on the some of the procedures side. Would would it be useful to to maybe see some of the tooling that, that we've put together if we were able to open source the tooling? Would that be beneficial? Like, could we have like a, a finance community open source reviews tool stack? <laughs> like, would that be useful? I think that would be great. Um, definitely. I mean, if you could at least share information about it, I mean, I mean that would be a, a starting point for discussion. Um, I'm also interested actually, are any of the, the two Sigma folks able to talk about their experience? I think they've been quite big contributors to open source. Um, yeah, I mean, so I know that my team does a lot of open source um, contributions in general. I mean, I am fairly new, so I haven't done that much extensive stuff, but in my experience, at least um, in some of the projects that my team does, it's been rather seamless to like transition between um, some of the like open source PRs and um, you know like some of the open source PRs that we do as well as the work that we do internally. So like for example, one big project that my team is working on is based on an open source project, um, and so a lot of us who are working on that project alternate between working on the internal stuff versus um, external PRs as well. Hi all, um, I'm an engineering manager at Two Sigma. Um, uh, my name is Zia. Uh, so yeah, we, uh, we definitely contribute extensively to open source and we also have um, an open source committee internally 
that reviews um, and approves, you know, what projects we uh, contribute to and, um, but, but we have, uh, we, we promote extensively um, and, and encourage engineers to uh, contribute to open source. Like we've hired quite a few open source maintainers internally, like for Jupyter Lab, for Pandas. Um, so there's a, a strong push towards, um, you know, open sourcing the things that we can and um, contributing actively. Thanks, Sia. Hi. Kind of multitasking so, part here, part elsewhere. So oh, <laughs> just yeah. let me know if there are any specific uh, questions you have for, for us. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, on that committee, like, uh, do you, can you, can you share like maybe um, a little bit about like the, uh, the, the domain expertise of that committee, like legal, uh, business domain. Yeah, that's a great point. So there's definitely security presence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, it's actually, it actually mostly consists of uh, engineering group heads and then security. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm sure legal at some point um, reviews it, but um, the initial group is engineering group heads and uh, security. Interesting. So would you say that that perhaps there's more of, of, a, of a cyber security concern with open sourcing than, a, than an intellectual property concern? I think it's both. Um, okay. I think it's both. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we certainly have both as well. And those are, those are folks, those are like domain expertise that are on that review panel for like a PR that, that were on the, on the old process we described, the manual process. Um, so you'd wait for a, a cyber review, you'd wait for uh, an IP review, and then a manager, engineering manager review would be kind of like the stages it would go through. So maybe a good place to start would be standards, like kind of trying to trying to develop like uh, a, a standard process um, that then maybe could be automated in the future. <laughs> maybe that's a good place to start. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it'd be good to understand. Um, uh, what are the, and it, just a bit of my background, I actually was in network engineering for a really long time and transitioned to um, lead in software engineering teams uh, about three years ago. So I'm also relatively new to the open source space. Um, my observations, at least from uh, Two Sigma's perspective, is there isn't a lot of friction around the, the approval process or contributing to open source. So I guess I'm curious about like, what are the specific challenges and other financial organizations around contributing to open source that, that we're looking to solve. I guess some of our challenges are, and you have them as well, so maybe I'm not uh, telling you anything, but we don't want intellectual property to escape. We don't want internal identifiers or like network topology or anything like that to go out. Um, the, the code typically has to be under an accepted license or a waiver has to be accepted. Uh, I don't know, what are the other things on the mic on the checklist? I think, I think you're hitting them. Um, I think the, the, the other challenge though is literacy, I think of like just understanding the, what is the process and, and scaling that out. Uh, so that because we have a lot of engineers right within the company and making sure that everyone understands like this is the process like we've had on our team because we participate uh in the open source through making making these contributions we have a lot of folks that will reach out to us to ask us what's the policy <laughs> we'll, well that's not really a, you know we'll, we'll redirect them to the to the official people uh that, that that are in the program office for that um so i think that's a challenge too is just like awareness and literacy right 
and now that we have that internal tooling, there's dedicated support devoted to it. And I think that is a big help. They have documentation that walks them through the use of the tool and therefore the process of contributing to open, open source. So I'm curious, uh, Z, I'm curious, to, I'd be curious to know like why, or why you think that maybe that's not as much of a challenge for you, the, the, the awareness and literacy you think. So what I, I don't think is a challenge is the process around contributing to open source. Um, I think that, you know, if you asked the average engineer, they're still not necessarily sure where the line is in terms of, you know, what's IP and what isn't. Um, so of course, like promoting um, sort of knowledge around that and um, having people think about it um, in the same way consistently um, is definitely something that can be improved. But I think the process by which, so today engineers don't have to think about it because the, there is a process where you say, okay, I wanna contribute to this project. Um, this is, um, this is um, how I expect to um, contribute, um, approve or not, and you wait for a response and then you, off you go and it's usually timely. So that, that exists and um, yeah, so I, I think that, that's more what I meant. So it's usually timely and that, that, that yeah. committee gets back pretty quickly. Yeah. Like there's a clear process around um, approvals and uh, contributions to open source. Mm -hmm. it, does that exist at uh, other because it sounds like you were talking about automation, but I'm also not sure if like the manual process is there and clear. The, for us, the manual process exist, uh, okay. existed. Uh, it, the, the challenge was the, the turnaround time was um, left a bit to be desired on the developer end, right? So, uh, and, and the, the program office understood that uh, and rather than staffing up kind of that committee to do the re manual reviews, they chose to automate it. Automate much of it, at least. So have, it, it, you said they chose to automate. So automation is in place right now? Yeah, we now have that. Oh, yeah. okay. And so what does that automation look like? Was that what you were referring to with the git uh, commit hooks and? That's right. Yes. Yeah, Dan was talking so, about. So it is, is it an approval per PR? Yes. So, I mean, roughly the process, as I understand it, is that we have this tool. It has built-in filters for things like um, user IDs and passwords and uh, IP addresses and that kind of thing. So that, that part of it is completely automated. And a developer gets to know whether they match a regex, essentially. There's some other heuristics, but uh, immediately. That's really great. That doesn't have to go through. Um, like a security review because the tool takes care of 99% of that. Um, and that's, Dan, that's, to be clear, that's at the commit, right? Yeah, that's at the commit level. So when you attempt to um, put a commit message on it, you know, you get a, it gets screened. And then at the next step, yeah, the, there's a PR view process. So once you've submitted a PR, that triggers kind of the manual workflow that things have to go through. And, um, Essentially, every commit in that PR has to, um, I mean, they're not necessarily like checked off one by one, but every every commit in that PR is essentially approved, which has caused some problems before. Like if you if you get feedback and you have to make a change, that triggers the review process again, the manual part of it. But, um, and then once uh, PR is signed off on, then it can be uh, merged. Anyway, yeah, so there's uh, part automation, part manual process. Uh, Jira's on the back end for that manual process. So everyone can see where they are, where they sit in the process. Got it. And then eventually you get what's called a trusted contributor status on that project and you're just using the automated tool at that point. Yeah. All right, cool. 
It's a good discussion. I think we just got a time check. Anything else on that? And maybe we'll move on to the next, next topic. So I think that's an area just to leave, leave it. I think that's an area like that would be a great way to collaborate, you know, try, try to figure out if there's any like tooling to automate this process, but we have different needs, you know, and so it, and different, different points of friction. So I think it's good to compare at least experiences. Um, so I appreciate that. It's a good discussion. Uh, we, we, we touched on this with some of the talks, uh, this next topic, uh, deployment challenges, but that's, that's something that, that we faced uh, a lot of Capital One. A, a lot of the, the talks that we gave was, was focused more around what we've done with Dask um, in building tooling on top uh, of it and working with our users. Um, we have, an, we have an, uh, a whole separate team that handles a lot of the deployment, but we've also done a lot of deployment uh, as well. Um, and kind of this, this general challenge that we have is uh, there's enterprise-wide deployments and how do we consolidate you know, those, uh, those teams and, and the, those resources or, or for, for the entire enterprise. Uh, but then we have uh, also line of business deployments. Uh, and then there are cases where we've, we've uh, deployed desk um, for individual uh, teams in, in various lines of businesses that we're working with. Um, and, and so to date, we've deployed Dask in pretty much every way possible, apart from the HPC stuff. Uh, we actually got in pretty early with Dask Cloud Provider uh, when uh, some of the folks at NVIDIA, Jacob Tomlinson, was, started to develop that. Um, and we're kind of early adopters and users of that. And now, we've, now we're using uh, Dask Gateway. So one of the things I wanted Dan to, to maybe talk a little bit, because Dan's contributed a lot to Dask Gateway, just to kind of go over that real quick so folks uh, get exposure to that. Sure. So uh, our challenge, I mean, like Mike said, we've deployed Dask Gateway in every way uh, possible. Um, I'm sure almost every way except for the HPC stuff. So the, uh, but one particular challenge that we have is a consistent way to deploy Dask clusters on behalf of individual users without allowing them access to the underlying resources, such as Kubernetes or AWS. Um, we those both have heavy presences within Capital One, especially Kubernetes going forward. Uh, Capital One already had a system based on EC2 and ECS, allowing uh, a user to start an instance or a container that hosts a notebook and also, um, you know, a terminal with a Linux computing environment. Uh, users use this to uh, do analyses, and in the days before Dask. If they had a big memory job, they would just pick the biggest EC2 instances they could find, and there aren't that many of them. Um, and then when Desk, Desk came along, it promised us distributed computing, but all of the existing deployment tools, like um, we said, Desk Cloud Provider, but there's also Desk Yarn and Desk Kubernetes, all required some um, kind of lower level system access that I think most people weren't uh comfortable giving analysts uh access to and it's not that they couldn't figure it out but i think it was just a bridge too far maybe and um so das gateway comes in because it kind of replicates that previous user experience of a user starting um a single notebook and that role is filled by jupyter hub and das gateway allows them a simple uh using the cluster interface essentially to start das clusters our challenges there just had to do with um, we on our so Dask Gateway allows you to deploy if you're not familiar um, Dask clusters to Kubernetes environments. Our particular challenge with that was that our Kubernetes clusters, probably very similar to Cook, have their own security policies and um, different methods of access that were kind of unique to Capital One and um, we were able to work with the Dask Gateway open source team and the team who was deploying the Dask Gateway in order to uh, make the changes necessary to Dask Gateway to be flexible enough to operate in our particular environment. Um, our other challenge just had to do with authentication. Obviously, we don't want to uh, users to cross data boundaries. So we incorporated authentic. Um, our own authentication scheme into uh, Dask Gateway. They have a very similar system to Jupyter Hub, 
for authentication. So when it came to use Jupyter Hub to start notebooks, uh, the work that we did for DAS Gateway carried directly over. So uh, I guess that's our brief DAS Gateway story. And I'm curious, especially for the Cook folks, um, did you look at DAS Gateway or was it just not worth deploying kind of a, um, a solution like that? It sounds like your users have direct access to the cluster. Um, yeah, so I don't know that we specifically considered um, using DAS Gateway. I know that like for us, Cook is a very widely used thing within Two Sigma that like a lot of different um, distributed computing platforms sit on top of. So I think it was pretty, you know, um, like a, it was kind of the obvious choice for us, I guess, to also kind of situate Dask there as well as like the entry point, um, you know, for resources. That makes sense. We have um, different lines of businesses currently operate their own computing environments and Dask Kubernetes was very popular in that space. So I wonder, I wonder if a uh, Dask Gateway Cook Manager would be useful, since you, so so Cook must be something you have for infrastructure provisioning on top of Kubernetes. Yes. Ah. So. So well, it's so it's essentially like our internal job scheduler. So it allows um, you know any usage that you want of the resources. So then you can just um, put in a request to Cook, and it manages all of the resources and things for you. Mm -hmm. It does gateway has different backends. So just like you created that your cook uh, cluster manager, you could do nearly the same thing with desk gateway if you were so inclined. Mm -hmm. I wonder what the benefits would be. It'd be interesting. Yeah. It does desk gateway handles the auto scaling and other things that you expect. So it would be interesting at least. I guess the downside is you have to maintain a DAS gateway deployment. If your users are already savvy enough not to use that, then you know why would you? I'm curious if deployment is a barrier to using DAS within everyone's organization. Sorry, Dan, could you repeat that? I'm curious if deployment challenges are a barrier for uh, adoption of DAS within your organization. Uh, I, I would say for us, yes, they are. I mean, we, we are making progress there, but um, I, I think it's taken quite a long time for us, for Python in general, to be seen as, um, well, let's call it, you know, ready for enterprise deployment, enterprise level support, even at the same time that it, it was in very wide use. Are there, are there any, anyone else from other financial institutions that we haven't heard from that have had deployment challenges? Nope, everybody's doing fine, everyone else, it's just us. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we've only got a few minutes. Are there any? So we have three topics left. And, and, and I see some, some folks have added some new topics. So I want to make sure that uh, we have a chance for those uh, if possible. So does anybody want to nominate the next topic? Actually, I nominated two of them, but I'll, I'll nominate the oh. third, which is not mine, which, which I think oh. is probably a wider interest, which is the, the data storage and formats. 
um, which I, I guess comes from uh, from you. Uh, yeah, so I put this one here. This has been uh, a pain point for us, um, particularly we have uh, a wide variety of uh, data storage formats. Um, we, we've got some very large CSV files. We've got uh, Parquet files that uh, either have been created from CSV files or from uh, Hive uh, data store dumps from, from like Spark ETL workloads. Um, in that case, we found that the metadata and the way in which the, the Parquet files are, are uh, partitioned uh, is not so great for Dask. Um, so we often have to load the data, um, uh, add, add metadata on our own, or there was a new feature added to, to have um, uh, a global metadata file uh, pulled in. Um, to Dask, uh, and, and we were really happy to see that. Uh, and sometimes we'll have to load the data that's been dumped from Hive, uh, repartition it, and write it back out. And then, that, so we're, there's a lot of like data engineering that has to happen. We can't just like go pull from the data uh, wherever it's persisted sometimes. Um, and, and likewise for CSV files, because they're just not partitioned, they're just not stored efficiently. There's a lot of uh, parsing that's happening there. Um, we've run into issues there as well. Um, so we'll, we'll pull in a C, large CSV file and then write out a uh, Parquet data set. Um, SQL is also a challenge. We have, we have a lot of SQL databases um, and there's not, the, we, we've got some documentation that we've we pushed for in the Dask community for Dask SQL, but um, I don't know if anybody attended the, the SQL workshop um, yesterday, but there's there's some starting we're starting to get some traction here and some motivation to to work uh, on SQL data loads uh, into Dask data frames that are like on a distributed cluster. And the challenge there is always like figuring out the chunking and, and the, or the partitioning and all that kind of stuff ahead of time. Whenever you don't know how much data is going to come out of this query that you're going to run on a on an SQL database. Um, so things like uh, predicate pushdown and for the for the uh, for the um, SQL would be really, really nice. Um, and then integrating that with Blazing SQL somehow or some kind of SQL uh, Snowflake Dask optimization that, that Snowflake starting to work on would be nice. Um, so that those are all kind of challenges for us. So I'm curious, I wanted to make sure we talked, to, talked about that, see if anyone else had those challenges or other challenges I didn't mention. Another aspect of what you said, Mike, was um, we have a lot of folks doing work in um, Spark and Databricks. And then, so like the intermediate format will be CSV or Parquet. They'll do their, their ETL in those uh, products. And then on the other side, we'll get a CSV and everyone can read CSV. Uh, but then when we go, if we, we get a Spark generated Parquet file, um, it won't have an appropriate index. Sometimes the metadata is wrong. Uh, it won't have division information like for um, you know it's important in desk. So uh, just working between products sometimes the the formats, even though they might both be parquet, they still require work. I had really sorry. Go ahead. No, you go, Michael. I was gonna say I've, I've had similar to what Mike was describing, except I've been using Athena on the AWS a fair amount for kind of similar workflows of you have a huge amount of CSV files and it's I found and I, I, I never would really track down it if it was a kind of my uh, not using Dask quite properly, but I had certain workflows where I could do some you know I could convert data in Athena in maybe five minutes that when I was trying to do it with Dask of your converting CSV to Parquet and it was taking hours even when you were kind of trying to spin up a fairly large um, gateway so it was nice to I found a you know Athena or you know you could use Presto to really nice for that kind of conversion process um, but it's been a bit of a frustration where it'd be nice to then be able to kind of switch back and forth more interchangeably between creating them using Athena, switching back to Dask for certain workflows, maybe then, you know, using, you know, like Athena is also just a good source for Dask query, you know, to 
to be the source of the data frames. And I've found similar to the metadata issues you've been talking about, there are just kind of certain assumptions of either Presto and or Athena that are just slightly incompatible with Dask in terms of kind of things like predicate pushdown and, and the metadata that's available that's made it um, hard to kind of go back and forth as interchangeably. I kind of, I, I looked into it a little bit and I, about whether it was something, I'm not sure if, it, you know, I think Dask, at least in the way I was using it, was maybe, maybe using arrow under the hood for kind of some of the parquet um, kind of creation and metadata. So I don't know if it was something to bring up with that project of to try to standardize or at least make an option in terms of kind of the metadata creation and management. But it's very, it seems like very similar workflow issues and lots of pre-thinking through how you want to partition your parquet files and maybe having several different ways to partition mm -hmm. for different use cases. So we're at time and I'm going to ask folks to move over to Slack or to gather down to continue the discussion. And I'm going to stop right. recording and end the meeting now. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Great discussion. Um, I'll probably write some stuff up and we'll follow up in the Slack channel. Thanks, everyone.